Welcome, everyone. Hi, I'm Mike Fisher. I'm the CTO here at Etsy. Um, welcome to another amazing Codus Craft event. Um, this represents a really important aspect of our culture of learning and sharing. And this is my uh, little ad that if you like what you see and you want to be a part of the culture, find someone in a, either an Etsy uh, engineering sweatshirt or a Codus Craft shirt and talk to them about that. But on to the main event. Uh, tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing someone who needs no introduction, Rasmus Lerdorf. Um, Rasmus is known for authoring the first two versions of PHP, starting a group that maintains it, um, and continuing to contribute to new versions. He's also contributed to a number of other open source projects. Um, he has a long and illustrious career that includes seven years at Yahoo as an infrastructure architect, um, and has been at Etsy since 2001 as a distinguished engineer. He was born in Greenland, grew up in Denmark and Canada, and he was a systems design engineering degree from the University of Waterloo. Please welcome Rasmus. Thank you, Mike. All right, so uh, my talks, as always, are online here. Hopefully the folks, we have a, a viewing in Kansas City as well. Hopefully folks can hear me and see me. So hello, Kansas City as well. Um, and all the other folks watching online. Uh, my Twitter, at Rasmus. So, I'm old. <laughs> uh, two days older than Fish here, I learned today <laughs> earlier, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and I'm feeling especially old today because I turn 50 next week. Um, which, uh, to me, that sounds kind of old. Um, especially because this was my first computer. This was a Timex Sinclair, um, early 80s. It had 1K of memory. <laughs> you think about that, right? 1K, 1024 bytes. That was all the memory the entire computer had. Right? We have all kinds of devices that have way more memory than that. You probably have three or four on you that have way more than that now. That big box at the back, was a memory expansion module. It added 16K. <laughs> so with that, you had 17K to work with. But because it was so big and bulky, every now and then it would fall out. And your memory on your computer would drop from 17K to 1K. So I remember writing code for this thing, and my critical loop had to stay in the bottom 1024K, or else the whole program would crash. And I had no way of saving this thing, right? Um, so you have to retype it then, because there was no storage of any sort whatsoever. Um, so I wrote code that would stay in the bottom 1024K, could allocate stuff up in the higher memory, but it was just a completely different world from what we live in today. I ended up with other computers, VIC-20, Commodore 64, sort of the standard pattern for folks my age. Um, I bet you had these same computers. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Um, I got my first Haze modem. 2400 baud modem. A lot of folks in here have probably never seen such a thing. <laughs> you hook the phone line into this thing and that's how you connect it to the world. <laughs> yeah, I used to talk a little bit about this and all the folks in the room would, yeah, yeah, I had this type of modem, I had this type of modem. Now I'm getting so old that there are people in here who have never seen a modem. There are people in here who weren't alive when I started PHP which kind of blows my mind. All right, so my life was sitting there watching Zed Modem download stuff from the internet, if you will, from BBSs, really, um, very, very slowly. The 90s, we got a little bit closer to the web. We had this thing called Gopher. This was the closest thing we had to the web when I was in university. And it linked mostly academic papers to each other. So you would read the paper, and the bottom you had all the, the references, and you could then sort of cursor down and click on references for that paper and it would jump to whatever university um, hosted that particular paper and you kind of had that concept of hyperlinks. But it was really only used in academia, a little bit in government stuff as well, but it was very, very limited. I worked a little bit on that in the 90s because I've always had this passion for sort of building online communication type things. I wrote the BBS 
um, as well in the 80s, for example. But the world changed pretty much exactly 25 years ago when the first graphical web browser came out called Mosaic, this thing. I was living in Mountain View, California, working for a Brazilian company. And this came out and I just said, look, I've been talking about the internet, I've been talking about the web, here it is. You can see it and everyone could see what was going to happen, except the company I was working for. They were a little slow. <laughs> so I ended up quitting and moving back to Toronto to do basically web consulting. Um, I probably should have stayed in Mountain View. <laughs> I remember going to a user group talk and there was a guy there who pitched this idea of a company called eBay. <laughs> he was trying to hire engineers. <laughs> so yeah, I probably could have been like the first engineer at eBay or first engineer at a whole bunch of startups in Mountain View at that time. But I skipped town and went back to Toronto. Anyway, that was sort of the, the, the the look of the web, or sort of the, the way you programmed the web in 1993, looked like this. This is C, this is a CGI program with HTML embedded in it. It was nasty. Any little type of change you had to make to the look and feel, you had to recompile, redeploy, and running a CGI on servers meant you had to fork and exec a new process for every single request. It was really slow. The whole world moved on to CGI PM which is a Perl module for writing the same thing. So this is the same output, a little form that asks for your name and age. And now instead of embedding it into C, you're now embedding your HTML logic in Perl, which I didn't like at all. And you still had the fork and exec problem. This time it was even worse because you had to fork and exec a Perl process, which was really heavy on 1993 hardware. So that didn't work for me either. I wanted my web solution to look more like this. I wanted the HTML to look like HTML, and I wanted the business logic separate from the display and presentation logic. That might sound a little weird to folks because PHP is kind of known for mushing it all together. That's because PHP is nothing like what I thought PHP should be. I basically wrote a C API for the web with a very simple macro templating language for exposing your business logic that you write in C to basically macro language would give you a very, very easy way of just putting little macro tags into your pages that would call back to your backend business logic written in C. And that entire idea failed completely. Nobody run, wanted to write C. The web was growing so fast, and all the heavy-duty C developers thought the web was a fad. They weren't really interested. And there were all these folks out there that were looking for people to help build dynamic websites for them. And most of these people were not developers. And they saw my little templating language here um, and said, hey, that's cool. I can build a guest book. I can build a simple product catalog just using these example tags. And I had included a bunch of example applications with my C API saying, look how easy it is to build a guest book. Or I had five or six sample applications kind of to show off the, the API. But people kept asking me for new features for the templating system. Saying, well, if we need to put the same set of tags many times, it would be really helpful if we had functions. So we could just call a function it would output the same set of tags. Yeah, okay, I guess. Um, and then people would say, well, we also need looping so that we can just loop over like a set of products and, and output the same tags. And, okay, so loops, fine, functions, fine. They say, well, we have functions. Why can't we call a function from within the function? Okay, so you want recursion in the templating language? And I was getting more and more skeptical. It's like, okay, fine. Then I looked at my state machine. It was all state machine driven. It's like, oh, it's easy enough to jump back to the same state. Okay, here you go. You have recursion now. It's like, but, but wait. How do we end the recursion? Well, you didn't ask for that. Because <laughs> that would require, that would require like locally scoped variables and static variables and things like that. That doesn't belong in a templating system. But eventually over time, this templating system just, it just kept adding more and more little things to it. And I refused for years to call that a language. This was simply the templating system on top of the PHP C API. 
that was sitting on the back end. But it just grew and grew and grew and grew because the web grew like crazy. And I spent a lot more time on the infrastructure and the ecosystem around PHP, making sure that all the different pieces talk to each other. So that was really my focus, was making sure that all the pieces, so operating system, easy enough, Linux. Um, but this concept of LAMP came out of this, Apache, MySQL, PHP, and Linux. And it really wasn't an accident. There were a few of us that thought about this and sat down and made sure they all spoke to each other very, very well. So I wrote an Apache module for PHP called ModPHP so that we could embed PHP into the web server so we didn't have to fork an exec, a new process on every request, which sped up everything up by a ton. It was kind of a game changer at the time. But I also spent a lot of time on the backend databases. My database of choice back then was a little database called MiniSQL because I couldn't afford an Oracle license and Postgres 95 at the time just crashed all the time. Um, so I used this thing called MiniSQL, but it didn't have cursors or anything special. So if you did a select star and by mistake selected from a table that had a million rows on slow NICs that we had back then, it would take a while to sit there and wait for all the results to come across the wire. And then you're probably like on a product page or a search page where you only show the first 10, but you're sitting there waiting for a million rows to come across and you're just gonna throw out most of them. So I go, this is stupid. Let's, let's tell it up front how many rows we want, which is when I added the limit clause to, to MiniSQL. Um, so you just select star and any, probably most people in this room who've written any sort of PHP, you've hit the limit clause. Select star from some table, limit 10, right? Just give me the first 10 results. MySQL came along about two years after that and said, hey, we would like your PHP to support MySQL. And we've made it really easy for you. We've cloned the mini SQL C API. So you can just do a search and replace in your text editor and change MSQL to MySQL and recompile and you'll have MySQL support. It's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So I did that. I was like, but wait a second. Most PHP apps are using this limit thing, and MySQL doesn't have limit. I'm like, what's limit? I'm like, well, and I explained limit to them. I'm like, well, that's not part of the standard. I'm like, what standard? <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't know there was an ANSI standard for SQL. I'm like, well, I, whatever. There are lots of standards. Forget the standard. If you want me to support MySQL and PHP, add limit, please. And they did. Um, and now limit has now migrated to lots of other databases, which I find really funny because I was basically blackmailing MySQL at the time to add it. <laughs> <laughs> and I do get hate mail every now and then from people saying, what the hell is with this limit thing? Didn't you read the standards? Like, nope, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also spent a lot of time thinking about shared hosting because everybody back then were on a very low cost virtual host, usually on an Apache server. And in order for these ISPs to offer the $5 a month virtual host account, it had to be really, really easy for them to provide this service. And they had to be able to do it safely and somewhat securely so that different um, customers couldn't step on each other. And this is where Mod Pearl came along and made a fatal mistake. They made it way, way too powerful. In Mod Pearl, you could go in and you could munge every stage of the request um, there's sort of this request rec in, in Apache where it goes through phases. The first one is the URL translation. So the request comes in, here's a string, this is the, the host that we want and the path. In PHP, you can't touch that from your PHP code. You are only in the content generation hook. So the virtual host that serves up the thing and the directory and everything, that's chosen for you by the web server. And then PHP kicks in and just delivers content. In Mod Perl, you could hook in and you could take that and say, okay, you want this virtual host? No, no, that's gonna go to my virtual host instead. So that meant that ISPs could not offer Mod Perl to their customers. Every customer who wanted Mod Perl had to have their own Apache instance. And that was not an easy thing for people to do back then. We didn't have containers, we didn't have any of that stuff. So you basically had to have a dedicated server. And then your price went from $5 a month to $300 a month. Um, so. That's why WordPress is written in PHP. That's why lots of things, that's why Wikipedia is in PHP, because MediaWiki is in PHP. All these things started as small projects on virtual servers. Um, 
And people chose PHP because it was available everywhere, not because it was the best language. It certainly wasn't. There were tons of languages back then that were trying to be in the position that PHP was. But the ecosystem that they built around it was never there. It was usually a language geek who wrote a beautiful language that didn't talk to anything. Yes, it's beautiful, but you can't make an SQL query. You can't hook it up to a web server. What good is it, right? So there is a reason why PHP won that war. And yes, it's not because it's the most beautiful language. It certainly isn't. I have no idea how to write a language. And it shows in many parts of PHP. <laughs> PHP has gotten much, much better as other people came in and took over sort of the core language part of PHP development. We also thought a lot about scaling, or at least I did. I wanted to make it really, really easy to get started with PHP because the audience for PHP back then and even today was not always the most technical people. Think about the hello world in PHP, right? Open a text editor, type hello world, save. That's a perfectly valid PHP script. You don't need tags or anything, echo hello world. Just hello world in a text file will output hello world. Think about how you do that in Java. Or think about how you take an HTML page that's already designed, has everything, but now your boss tells you, hey, could you add um, the number of widgets left in inventory to that existing page? So make an SQL query and put just the number in here at this spot in the page. How would you do that in Java? Just putting, a, even if it's just the current time, putting that in the right spot in the HTML file in Java, you're going to have to read in the HTML file, somehow parse the XML, and then figure out the right place and everything in that XML data structure to insert the date and then output everything again. In PHP, how do you do that? You open up the HTML file, you put in echo date, right, in the right spot, you save it, you're done, right? It takes you three minutes to do what well, takes you probably a week or two to figure out in Java. So that was the part of scaling down that was very, very interesting, and that got people very interested in PHP because the easy things were just trivial. The really hard things are no easier in PHP than in any other language. You have to architect it correctly, you have to think about all the components, and in large architectures, the language kind of becomes irrelevant at that point. It's more about the architecture than the language itself. So, because it's easy to get started, when you don't know enough, to know your problems, PHP solves everything. And by the time you're big enough to have all these problems, PHP is not your biggest problem anymore. All right, enough about the past. Um, this is kind of the past too, but I threw this one in because I'm at Etsy and half the people in the room are Etsy folks. And we are still on PHP 7.1 at Etsy. So I wanted to give a little preview of what's coming for, for Etsy folks in 7.2 and 7.3. Um, Initial DCE and SCCP stuff. DCE is dead code elimination, um, sparse, constant stuff. Um, I'll talk about these optimizations later, but I find it really, really cool. Parameter type widening. This basically just says that you can widen the type when you are inheriting. Um, in 7.1, you couldn't do that. There really is nothing. If you go by the Liskov stuff, there's nothing that prevents you from widening types here. So that's now allowed from 7.2 and onwards. We also allow trailing commas everywhere now, kind of our JavaScript nod to the comma wars in the JavaScript world. Um, so yeah, trailing commas are allowed pretty much everywhere. We missed one spot, which I'll get to. <laughs> There's an object type hint. So if you know something returns, so it takes an object, but you don't quite know which object, you can just say object. This should be used carefully. <laughs> if something takes an object and they call certain methods, you can't just say object. It has to be a specific one. But there are certain things like serialization and, and stuff like that that can, if it can serialize any object, then fine. You can, you can put an object type hint in there. We've also deprecated unquoted strings. So now you get a warning. They still work. It was kind of a silly thing that that actually worked. That's, it, it made sense in the early days but it hasn't made sense for many, many years to allow this, so that's going away. Completely gone by PHP 8. Very small thing here, you can add a, you can set the, the headers argument to mail can now be an array 
It used to have to be a string with a bunch of carriage returns in it, which led to all kinds of injection security issues when people were able to inject stuff into this, this string. Um, it's a little cleaner now with an array. Um, there's a new hashing mechanism called argon2i that you can use. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unexpected reaction to argon, okay. Um, we've also made libsodium a, a part of the standard package. Um, the, the sodium crypto library replaces mcrypt. mcrypt is a dead library that everyone uses but hasn't been updated in years and years and years, which is a really bad thing for a security library. So libsodium is way better. There's a very good set of documentation with all kinds of examples on how to move from mcrypt to sodium at this URL here. So things that might break, mcrypt being removed, obviously if you rely on mcrypt, you're gonna have to deal with that. It is possible to compile mcrypt out of Peckle and install it yourself, and the various distros still provide packages for PHP 7.2 of mcrypt. Please, you have to do this work at some point. I know you're just putting it off, like, I will do it next time, but this is security stuff. This is not something you should be putting off. Please do the work of migrating off of mcrypt. For a decent developer, it's not gonna take them more than a day or two to migrate those few calls in your code where you're doing some hashing or doing something with mcrypt. And everything mcrypt does is supported by um, Lipsodium. Doing autoload, please start using SPL autoload register instead. It does a better job of chaining autoloaders, things like that. Um, create function. No real point of that now that we have the short syntax for anonymous functions. Um, each was always kind of a funky one. I don't see that use very much anymore, but please switch to for each. And we changed that one function name to clean things up a little bit. If you're upgrading, read the upgrading document as always. There's one for every new version of PHP. If you have any internal extensions, um, there's the same document for the C code. All right, 7.3, which should be coming out in the next month or so. One feature people have been asking for for years is to clean up here docs. In the past, your closing tag here had to be at the beginning of the line, which made indented code look kind of ugly because you always had to have that, that ending tag in the left column, right? Now, if the ending tag is indented, say, four spaces, then four spaces is removed from the content as well, right? So this bar would be in the left column. If you indent this one space further from the ending tag, then it would, there would be one space in the output, right? We also have people using continue inside a while inside a switch case, which is always kind of weird. Like, what does this continue do here, right? It doesn't continue the loop. It actually acts like a break in this case, which confused people. It really should just be break in this code. But now if you do use a continue instead of a break, you get a warning saying this is probably not doing what you thought it did. Most people who use continue use it to continue a loop. But if they have that inside the switch, it doesn't actually continue the loop. So now there's a warning that helps you catch that mistake. We've also added references to the list, so both the long form and the short form of the list syntax. You can now have references in it that used to not work. Plus, that one spot we missed in allowing trailing commas everywhere. You can now also have trailing commas in, on the arguments in function calls. It was completely unintentional that we missed that one, so we're fixing that in 7.3. There's a new monotonic timer function a monotonic timer is a timer that never stops, never goes backwards, always goes forwards. Might sound strange, but you can have timers on a Unix system or any other system that go backwards or stop for a while. And if some code is timing critical, having time go backwards in the middle of that code does very strange things, right? So like one reason that time can either sort of stop, go backwards, or just slow down a bit is um, NTPD 
things, right? So sometimes your network time protocol stuff will say, hey, your clock is a little fast. Slow down for a little while so that we sync, right? Or the administrator can simply go and change the system time on you, right? You have leap seconds, you have all kinds of weird things where time jumps all over the place. Um, with a monotonic timer, it always go forward at the right rate. So if you do have things that are timing things, even just a timing function around some code, really should use HR time now instead of microseconds, or micro time, sorry. If you're using FPM, there's now a very nice status function that will return the status for the overall your, your FPM pool or the various pools and then each process as well and shows you what it's doing. It's kind of like the Apache scoreboard. You know when you do like st slash status in Apache and you see the scoreboard of what all the processes are doing? You now have the same thing for, for FPM. There's a new function called is countable. One of the changes I didn't actually talk about in 7.2 is that the count function is much stricter about what you can count. If you pass it things that aren't arrays and are not countable, instance of countable, then like why are you counting it? Why are you counting like a scalar variable? There's one, right? What the hell? What's that count for? Um, so that actually has a warning now in PHP 7.2. What that caused was a lot of people started writing code like this before calling count on something. It's like, is it an array or does it implement countable? If so, then we can count, otherwise we do something else. And that was a lot of code to write for that. So now there's a new is countable. Personally, I think you should already know if you can count this thing, but that's me. Uh, there's a new array key, array key last, array key first, array key last. People were using reset and end to get those keys, um, which has the side effect of moving the, the array cursor, plus you could also only do it on actual variables because you're modifying the, the argument. With array key first and array key last, you can do that on anything. And more DCE, these mysterious DCE and SCCP optimizations, so a lot more of them in, in PHP 7.3. Those are a lot of fun. Other changes move from PCRE to PCRE 2. That's the regular expression library we're all using. Um, get all headers is now available for FPM and a few other things. So things that may break, obviously a new regex library, there's a possibility of some regular expressions breaking. I haven't personally found any that broke, but it is possible. ODBC router and bird step are gone. I bet nobody in here even know what these are. Um, but again, as always, please read the upgrading documents if you're moving to 7.3, which you shouldn't do yet, not until we release it, but please test our release candidates now betas as they come out in the next couple of weeks. There are already some out. All right, so what does all this mean? It means if you're still running PHP 5.4, you're kind of lucky. You have a lot of performance boosts ahead of you. Although if you're still running 5.4, maybe those will never come because you've had so many years and you haven't upgraded, so who knows. Um, but anyway, we've made steady progress. Obviously the big jump in 2015 to PHP 7.0 was kind of crazy. This was a 20 year old project at that time and suddenly we jumped by a factor of like 2.5 in performance without really breaking anything. Broke a few things, but only at the edges. Um, that was kind of magic. It's been a bit rough going since then. We're not gonna get the same jump again. PHP 8 and even PHP 7.4 might have a jump for certain bits of code, but as you can see, 7.3 isn't actually too bad. For 7.0 to 7.1, pretty much nothing. We were just cleaning up stuff. 7.2, a little jump, but 7.3, not bad. And at Etsy, we're going, to, we're going to be jumping from 7.1 to 7.3, and I have talked to a bunch of people before from other companies as well who are on 7.1 today. If you're not ready to do your 7.2 upgrade right away, maybe jump straight to 7.3. The work is about the same. The, the amount of the things that break between 7.2 and 7.3 are minimal, right? So if you're going to do the work once, I would go 7.3. And it's not a big breaking release. Also internally, we didn't change that many things. So it's not gonna be any more unstable than 7.2. I mean, wait one or two dot releases before you go full production with it. But by like 7.3.2, I would say full speed ahead. Which should be by early January, 
late January. Memory use. This is why we sped up so much in PHP 7. Loading the WordPress front page dropped from 140 megabytes to 15. Right? Crazy, crazy drop. At Etsy, I think for some of our pages, we dropped from like 80 down to 12 megabytes of memory used to, to render the page. Um, so that was the big thing that we did. We cleaned up memory handling to get all this speed. Versions. One of the things we're doing, we're releasing a new version every year. And we're also, um, we can't, we have a small team in the PHP project that we can't support 10 different versions. So we're also ending support for versions pretty quickly to try to encourage people to upgrade. Security fixes obviously go a bit longer. And for 5.6, we extended it because the jump to 7 is a lot of work. So that's a bit longer than usual. But the 5.6 security fixes are going to stop by the end of the year. So if you're still on PHP 5, by the end of the year, you're not going to get security fixes. And that should be really bad news for you. You can't keep running code that will not get security fixes. So if nothing else has convinced people at whatever company you're at to upgrade, hopefully this will help. The huge performance boost should really be all you need to tell people. That, hey, we can turn off half our AWS instances once we do this upgrade. Your bill gets cut in half. Your hosting bill gets cut in half. I don't see how their argument can fail anywhere. But apparently it has. Um, so yeah, the new version 7.2 by like almost to the end of 2021 will still have security fixes. But still, I would still recommend going to 7.3. Another argument for upgrading, I have a son. I would like him to have a world to live in <laughs> as he gets older. It's looking a little dicey right now. I live in California. Half the state is on fire. It's hard to breathe the air. Not very nice. Um, so we're getting close to 50% PHP adoption. We're actually a little bit below that, but I don't want to update my slide every time I give a talk. Um, about about 2.5 million physical servers translates to about this much energy, this much money, this much pollution. 100%, we can double that. $4 billion in savings, a lot less CO2, CO2 into the atmosphere, so please. Upgrade to PHP 7. I, I keep trying to get people upgrading. I, I give them like three or four arguments. Hopefully one of them will stick or the combination. I don't know. It's kind of the bane of open software developers is that people who run 10-year-old versions and then file a bug report about something. Like, Come on, man. We fixed this thing seven years ago. Upgrade. All right. I promised to talk a little bit about DCE and sparse conditional constant propagation. This stuff is really heavy-duty computer science that I can really only explain with simple examples. So take this method here. It sets a variable A. In PHP, you have to declare a variable global inside an, a function or a method if you want to modify a global. So in this case, this is a local variable. It can't possibly have any side effects. And the optimizer in PHP 7.1, it wasn't there. It didn't do anything. It created these opcodes, we call them, kind of like the bytecode of PHP. And it basically says, assign one to A and return zero. In PHP 7.2 and 7.3, it knows, hey, this couldn't possibly do anything. Don't even generate the, the opcodes for it. And that part is important because the opcodes gets cached in what's called the opcode cache. And that's what runs on every request. So with 7.2 and 7.3, it's as if this line was never in your source code because it's, it's never hit. Try to trick it a little bit. Here we can see I am concatenating a bunch of input arguments. So these four first lines, these aren't actually executed. This is just telling me in the, in the opcode dump which registers these input variables are in. So these are essentially no ops. In 7.1, we do all this string concatenation. In 7.2, we see, well, there's no point doing all this work because we wipe it out a line later. And we assign the variable to x and return x, but we know x is always 0. So we don't even create the variable x here. We just say, hey, all this stuff just returns 0. Right? That obviously runs faster. If we try to trick it, b equals a plus equals 3. This is valid PHP. We didn't trick it. There's no sign of b here. We know b isn't used in anything. 
here's 7.2's optimizer can't quite figure out what's going on. And here's where the optimizations and the improvements in 7.3 kick in with this type of code. Gets interesting here. This is where the, um, there's another concept called escape analysis, where escape analysis kicks in and checks, is there any chance of anything escaping from this construct here? So in this case, we're instantiating an object A, or class A. A doesn't have a destructor, it doesn't have a constructor, it actually doesn't have anything. So this code really doesn't do anything. Instantiating A here and setting this property and then returning X doesn't do anything. These two lines can completely go away. So as the optimizer figures this out, it looks at this A class and says there's nothing here that can escape. We're just going to delete it and just return X from this method. If we added the structure, now there's a chance of something escaping because this destructor might do something. And right now, escape analysis is only one level up. It doesn't actually look into the contents of the destructor to see what it does. So in 7.3, it doesn't delete the class A anymore because there's a chance of escape. So this is exactly the same code, oops, as here, except we added the destructor to A. And now the optimizer says, uh-oh, I better do all this stuff because something might escape. It also looks inside arrays. So here we check if X is true or false, right? And we set A to two different arrays. However, we only return the first element of that array. The first element of the array is always zero. The optimizer figures all this out, deletes everything here, and just says, hey, this function just returns zero. Don't bother creating A, don't bother creating the array, because no matter what input it gets, it always returns zero. And we can kind of go crazy with this. Like all this code, if you sort of walk through it slowly, you can figure out all it ever does, it echoes one and returns four. Obviously, this is going to run a hell of a lot faster than if we created the opcode for all these operations and ran that. So there is a potential for PHP 7.3 of being drastically faster on your code. If it is, your code is crap. Because it meant the optimizer deleted all your code. <laughs> I mean, there, will, there are still other optimizations that will kick in. PHP 7.3 will be faster. But if it's more than 10 to 15% faster than earlier versions, yeah. I wouldn't brag about the speed ups too much on Twitter. <laughs> all right, a little bit on static analysis. I wrote one called FAN, or I started the project as all my projects. I start them and someone else takes over and makes them way, way better than I ever could. Right now there's a guy named Tyson in California who's taken over FAN development. This was a project I started here at Etsy for, because Etsy needed a static analyzer. Um, it's now going strong in Tyson's hands. Really easy to install, Composer require, FAN FAN. A very simple configuration file if you have a sort of standard Composer structured directory, where you have a source directory and have a vendor directory. This tells it to only analyze and spit out errors for things in source, but load in all the class definitions and everything you need from vendor, but don't report errors on other people's code. Only report errors on your own. Then run vendor bin fan, and it will scan your code, everything under source, and give you a long list of errors in your code. You can tune it. There's all kinds of configuration things you can put into config.php to ignore certain types of errors and, and tune the actual output. At Etsy, we use it a lot. Every single push has to first go through fan. And if fan complains, you have to go back and fix all this stuff. So we have a lot of Etsy folks swearing at fan um, and sort of indirectly at me because of that. But it does help catch really stupid mistakes. Every now and then, someone thanks me. Oh, man, fan caught a really dumb mistake. It's like, thank you. Cool. <laughs> kind of wipes out the other 10 people yelling at me. For <laughs> making their lives worse. Um, it checks lots and lots of things. Very short list of things it goes through here. It also, one of the big things is that it understands PHP doc type annotations, and it has a much richer, richer type system that we can do um, at runtime in PHP for performance reasons. So for example here, we have three arguments. The first one can either be a string or an int. There's no syntax for that in native PHP, right? The second argument is an array. We have syntax for that in PHP, but we don't have generics. We don't 
we can't say this array should only contain integers. We can do that with fan. And finally, we can also do shaped arrays. We can say this has to be an array, and it has to have a key named mode, which has a string value, and another key named max that has an integer value. If it doesn't have this content exactly, it's not a valid argument. You run it here, these first three runs are fine, because here we have a string, we have an int, um, and here we have a max and mode in our thing. And now these two next calls are not good. And this first one, this is not a string or an int, it's an array, and that's what the fan error comes up. It says, hey, argument one, you passed in an array, but it takes an integer or a string. This next one comes up and says, uh-uh, this argument here needed a mode and a max. You only passed in max. So these are the types of things it can check and the types of PHP doc type annotations you can add to your code to make your code better, basically, more robust. Also has a whole bunch of user plugins, this demo plugin to help you write new ones. You can check reg syntaxes. There's a printf syntax checker as well. You know, like a printf string, percent %s, percent %d. If you don't pass a string and an int, it can check that at um, a static analysis time as opposed to getting runtime errors on that. Um, if for some strange reason you don't like PHP's dollar dollar syntax, it can warn you about using dollar dollar. Personally, I love dollar dollar. If you go beyond two, it gets a little questionable. Three, four, five, uh, you're in trouble. There's nothing in PHP that prevents you from going to 30. But good luck figuring out what that does. <laughs> When I wrote it, again, it was all state machine driven. There was absolutely no problem, like maybe limited by memory, but there was absolutely no problem going as deep as I wanted. So I didn't limit it. I probably should have. I probably should have limited it at two because there's really no good case for three even. And the fact that you can go to a thousand just makes no sense whatsoever, but you can. Um, it also has a really cool daemon mode where you can, if you have a big code base, it can take a while for fan to run in the sort of minutes, single digit minutes usually. It takes a few minutes on Etsy's code page, which, which is rather big. Um, and it's kind of cool, you can run it in daemon mode because then it scans everything once and then it keeps all, this struc all these structures in memory and then you can just do an incremental check every time um, you run this thing called fan client. And you can hook this directly into your text editor um, there's a little video, I don't, I'm running out of time, so I can't really show everything, but you can see I run up, run vin, config, it shows you the different plugins that I have enabled on this one. Run my daemon, check some source code. So here I go in and put in a deliberate mistake and try to save the file and right inside vim, immediately I get a static analysis error. Uh, directly in my text editor, kind of like what you get in PHP Storm with their built-in static analysis checks, but this you can hook into any system. And also you can hook it into obviously any sort of um, deploy process, which you can't do with PHP Storm because it's all GUI. There's no command line. All right, that was daemon mode. Last one, PHP Spy, written by Adam, sitting right over here. Um, PHP Spy is really cool. It's a low overhead sampling profiler that you can use to profile any running PHP code um, or not running. You can also start it right from the command line on the PHP script itself. But the really cool thing is you can, you can hook it directly up to something that's already running. We've already used this countless times at Etsy um, for like cron jobs that are not terminating for weird reasons or other gearman jobs that are running for a long time. Like what the hell is this code doing? And with PHP Spy, you can hook it up and look at what's happening inside that process. And to sort of show how it works, here's PHP Spy running on a, just a very simple PHP script that sleeps for one second. You can specify the frequency, the sampling frequency, either in nanoseconds or in hertz, so times per second. The default is 99 hertz, uh, or almost, a little over 10 times a second. Um, why not 100? because many things might be in 100 millisecond intervals, right? And if you keep only checking every 100, you might get these weird sample errors, right? Where you, you keep missing the thing you're looking for. 
um, by offsetting it slightly, you're more likely to hit the right thing. Um, so in this case, well, because I'm doing it every 200 milliseconds, that's going to be five times in a second, you see five stack traces. That basically says you were in main and you called sleep, or we're in sleep currently. So five times we see, hey, you're sitting in sleep, you're sitting in sleep, you're sitting in sleep. You see that five times, then the process ends. Um, then we get a little error at the bottom that says, no such process, because it died, right? It ended. This doesn't seem super useful by itself, right? Okay, so I get five stack traces, big deal. What can I do with that? If we attach it to something more complicated, you can't do that much more with it, but the stack traces get more complicated. This is running on WordPress. So I'm, this is PHP FPM running a WordPress server, and we can kind of look at where we are right now. So in this first one, we're in some load thing. The second one, we're doing a MySQL query, it looks like, from a get results thing, whatever. You can also get memory usage on stack frames, which is kind of cool, but it's not really used by any output mechanisms yet. So Adam, please, <laughs> call grind, perf, anything to actually show us um, where the memory is being used um, dynamically on a running PHP script, which is going to be really, really cool when we have that. Um, but right now, the most useful output you can generate is a flame graph. So here I'm running it on fan. That's doing a fan scan of some code, which takes a little bit of time. And you run it through these two scripts that come with PHP Spy that generates a flame graph of what's happening in that PHP process. And you get something like this. And it's an SVG that you can then click on, right? And you can zoom in and you can see how much time is being spent in all the different parts. And in this case, it was kind of evenly distributed because there aren't any real problems in, in this particular fan run. But sometimes you get this big one wide bar where you see, or maybe two, where it's jumping between two pieces of code and spending all its time there. And it becomes really, really obvious to see what's going on in your code and why it's slow because this huge wide bar, you're looking at it going, well, hey, this is a memcache lookup. It should be taking one millisecond and it's taking 800, what the hell is going on, right? So it's really useful for that. Um, there's also a cool top mode that looks like this. So this is a fan scan and it actually shows you just like top as it's running. Um, and then the delete to that at the end, which is a little bit frustrating. So fix that too, Adam, thank you. <laughs> I like having the author in the audience. I can gripe about things. Um, but okay, that's, that's my favorite new tool that most non-Etsy folks probably hasn't, haven't encountered before because it's only like two, three months old, I think. Yeah. Hasn't been around. All right, I'm out of time and I want some time for questions because that's my favorite part of these. Well, I'm not, oh, sorry, I forgot. PHP 7.4 is on the horizon. This is my one more thing piece of, of this talk. So type properties are coming in 7.4. It means you can put types here on properties, right? And if you assign the wrong things, you're going to get a warning. So we're going to runtime check proper type, uh, properties. Not normal variables, because that would really kill performance. This does hurt performance a little bit. But as long as you're not doing a, like this i++ in your loops, you should be OK, right? Nobody does that, right? But if you have code that does a lot of writing, to properties and a lot of reading from properties, then yes, your code will take a hit. Hopefully, this next feature will mitigate that a little bit. We always try to release a faster version of PHP every release. So this, this feature here is a little bit scary because it does slow us down. So we need another optimization to counteract that. And the one that Dimitri in St. Petersburg came up with is called preloading. What this lets you do is preload a class in the opcode cache. And there's actually two stages of caching in PHP. Well, two pieces of the cache. The first is you compile the script into a set of opcodes that gets cached in shared memory. Then on every request, you figure out which classes, which opcode arrays do we need from shared memory? And you kind of create those classes in this particular runtime context on a, on a per request basis. The initial compile into opcodes is the slowest part. So that, just having the opcode cache helps a lot performance-wise. But that second part of copying the right classes into the current request does take a little bit of time. And that's the piece that the preloading can eliminate. So here, without preloading, you have code like this. You have an A class sitting in a file like a.php. 
and you have an autoloader that loads A, and you do new A. You run this script, and you can see when we do this new A, the autoloader is going to get called. It's going to include a.php, and now we have our A object, and it's going to spit out A. In the preloaded case, in your INI file, you do opcache preload, and you point it at the script. This PHP script figures out what to preload. And here you might have some interesting logic that goes through and figures out what are our core framework components, or what are the really expensive things that we don't change very often that we can preload, and it becomes as if they're part of stock PHP, built into PHP as a native class, essentially, because they get preloaded and they get copied into PHP itself. So there is no per request cost for any of these things. Um, and then it gets interesting. And you run this code directly, script.php, you can see even though nothing, uh, this is, sorry, this is this code here, this same script is running, and you can see that the autoloader never got hit in this case because the A class was preloaded. And there's some very interesting things, especially if we get a decent JIT in PHP 8, the idea of being able to preload a class and JIT the thing, that leaves you to the point where you can almost write extensions that are as fast as C directly in PHP and have them be native in PHP, essentially. I can see all kinds of string classes popping up, fixing string arguments and things that people always complain about. But you can actually do that. Or we hope to get to the point where you can do that without any performance hit of using your own string class everywhere. So that's kind of cool. So that was the last thing. I need some time for questions because I get tired of hearing myself speak and I want to get questions from the Kansas City folks as well, but let's start in the room. Yes? Uh, are there any features that, um, like thinking about PHP, do you regret adding uh, to PHP? I'll repeat the question. So are there, are there any features that I added to PHP that I regret? No. I, the, my regrets have been not getting rid of some features sooner that I should have gotten rid of. For example, the fact that functions are not case sensitive, like the actual name of the functions. Back in 1993, story time again, um, people couldn't decide if HTML should be uppercase or lowercase, right? HTML tags themselves. It seems weird now, but back then there was a huge religious argument about whether HTML tags themselves should be uppercase or lowercase or even mixed case. And I just didn't want to be part of that discussion because remember my PHP was just a templating system that would fit into your HTML strategy. So if you wanted to go all uppercase, fine. Make your PHP tags uppercase. Make them lowercase. Make them mixed case. I don't care. If you really have two functions in PHP that only differ by case, you actually have other problems, I think. And that's kind of still the case today. But I remember wanting to change it probably like 1996. I said, like, oh man, I have like 12,000 sites out there using PHP. I'll break all of them if I change this. But 12,000 is a hell of a lot better than millions and millions that are out there now. So I probably should have taken the hit. And there are many cases like that where I think I should have taken the hit earlier. People ask me about Register Globals as well. Honestly, without Register Globals, we wouldn't be here. Register Globals was a feature where basically a variable, like if you have a form field with a, a field named name, you automatically get a PHP variable called name, a global variable called name in your code. That introduced the world to PHP and they saw how easy it was to create an HTML form and then manipulate the contents without knowing anything about get versus post versus anything, cookies, whatever. It just worked. Whether you made it a get form, a post form, whatever, you got a variable that has the same name as the form fields and that just drove adoption of PHP in the early days. So no, I mean, even a feature like that that everyone hates today, I don't regret adding it because there was a good reason for adding it at the time. Yeah. Um, ooh, sorry, um, nothing from the folks in Kansas City yet, but I just want to call out, uh, can folks in the room just make sure that they hop over to the mic in the center uh, okay. so that anyone on the live stream can sure. dial in? Hi. Hi. I'm Najla, we're coworkers. Um, <laughs> you said a handful of times uh, most people do this or some people do that or people never do this. How do you know that and what else is informing your decisions for what uh, features to build in PHP? Uh, so we, we do a lot of crawling GitHub and other source code repositories and, and big projects. So 
obviously we don't know for sure. We don't know a lot of proprietary code sitting inside big companies. I happen to have done consulting for a lot of big companies with huge PHP code bases, so I do have some insight into some of those as well. But generally, if we scan all PHP code on GitHub and we see like three people using a feature out of millions and millions of lines of code of PHP, then we have a good indication that not too many people are using this feature. Right? So that's really our input. And we also, we, we look for how many people scream when we add a warning to a feature. We tend never to just delete something. We always start adding a notice or a warning first. And then if we get a ton of bug reports complaining that there's this new warning, then we reconsider. If nobody notices, then a few versions later, the feature is gone. Yeah. Uh, we used to be coworkers. Yes. Um, <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so that you said that uh, there's DCE and escape analysis. Um, does that give warnings or errors if you're hitting that? Does fan catch that? Right, so that's, that's a very good question. And no, there is actually no way to know whether the optimizer has removed code on you. Um, you can run that same little PHP trick I did here with the, where was my syntax? Uh, I, I lost it. No, 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 here, okay, so this, Weird little, I have an alias um, in my shell basically called DOP, dump my opcodes, where I can run it on, um, on my code and I can see the opcodes and I can compare that to my function. Oh, wait a second, it has to remove stuff. It would be useful to get a finely grained error that basically says, hey, this looks like completely useless code, completely redundant code, you should probably fix it. Currently, there is no good way for the optimizer to do that. Because um, I mean, once it's, once it's optimized, it doesn't run again. So the only, it's only the very first time that you hit a script. It's not like every time you hit a script, you'll see this error. And it gets a little weird that you get an error that only happens the very first time and then it disappears. So I'm hoping to add support for this to fan. It's not super easy to do though. Um, but I, I think the, the static analyzers should be adding this, yes. Is that something that you would hope to use, reuse the same PHP runtime code in FAN, or would you have to re-implement it for FAN? Yeah, so if all of FAN is written in PHP, and all the PHP runtime stuff is in C, so we obviously can't run the same code. Um, it would be nice if there was a, well, there is kind of a hook in here, but there's, I am talking to Dimitri a little bit, if we could get an API, so FAN could actually call into the API, pass in the code, and get something out in a good structured format. Right now, all we get out is basically, the opcodes, and it's up to us to figure out do they match, right? Has something been deleted? Which, so you can run it twice. You can run it without optimization. You can run it with optimization. You can diff the two, and you can see, hey, the optimizer removes stuff, right? That's not a great API. Um, so I'm hoping to make it a little bit better. But I mean, you could easily write a tool that does exactly that um, and scan your code that way. But it's, it's yeah, it's not great. All right, I don't see any hands right now in the room. Anything from Kansas City? Nothing from Kansas nope. City. Oh, okay, so we need another question from here. <laughs> you again. Hi again. Um, why do you work at Etsy? Ah. <laughs> That's a bit of a layup, isn't it? Okay, yeah. Um, so I worked for Yahoo for many years, and I got quite tired of the conflict between the product teams and the revenue slash ad teams, right? They're always in conflict. Every, the ads folks wanted to add more ads everywhere and the product teams wanted to make the best product possible and that usually meant get rid of all the ads, right? Who wants blinking ads all over your email? Nobody, right? Um, but that, that fight and most web companies have that fight. Most web companies are ad driven, right? Etsy is not. That's really the, the sort of the, the basic reason why I'm at Etsy, but also because I think Etsy does cool stuff, right? I generally think Etsy provides a hell of a lot more value to the world than we extract from the world. And there aren't that many companies I can say, say the same thing for. So that's why I work for Etsy. Yes. Yeah, sorry, me again. Um, uh, what do you think, kind of this is like a style question, but, um, uh, HHVM, which is like 
Facebook's whatever has removed references, I think. They've like st stripped them from the language. What do you feel about references? Like pass by reference. Yeah. To me, I think it's a strange thing to, if I was gonna remove things, that wouldn't be my first. Um, and you need references sometimes. You need to be able to pass by reference. Um, it's not as complicated as a C pointer, right? You can't do pointer math or anything. You can't do crazy things with references. Um, I, so I, I don't really agree with that particular change. Other changes they've made, many things have been adopted in PHP 7, some of the early things that HHVM provided. Um, they helped us a lot in, well, they didn't help us, but they encouraged us and motivated us to work on performance quite a bit because we had kind of gotten stuck in not caring that much about performance, which was partially my fault because I saw these frameworks doing crazy things that would take a normal PHP script that should run at about 100 requests a second with a framework around it that ran at one request per second. It's like, well, why the hell are people using these heavy frameworks? They obviously don't care about performance. Um, so I was sort of feeling a little bit down on, on the world in general. I was like, oh, screw this. We're not gonna make it faster because nobody cares. Um, and HHVM came along and said, yeah, there are actually people who care about performance and that that kicked us a little bit and said, okay, let's, let's get back on performance. So that's the main thing that HHVM did. Some of those other changes, eh, it, it's kind of, it's syntax, it's religion for a lot of them, I think. And I'm not that religious about this stuff. PHP is just a tool, it's a hammer. I'm much more interested in what people build with the hammer than the nitty gritty details of things like that. We do have people on the PHP project that care about the nitty gritties though, because <laughs> <laughs> you need a few. Another one coming. You're not gonna ask me about frameworks, are you? No, 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 okay. that was a different question. <laughs> so years ago when I was a Java programmer, um, there was always this debate between Java folks and HP folks as to which was best. And over the last few years, a lot of PHP has, in my view, barred some of the, the things from, from the Java language. And I'm, the question is, to what extent when you go to, so to add new features to you? People always say that, that PHP borrows from Java. Really, it does. So, for example, this DCE stuff. There's a lot of this in the Java bytecode compiler as well. But some of these papers, the, the main paper that Dimitri is going off of was written in 1991 by some computer science PhD somewhere. Um, a lot of these concepts predate both Java and PHP. They're sort of basic computer science concepts, right? Um, objects and the way objects should work. There have been all kinds of papers over the years. So, yes languages tend to adopt the same types of principles and some of the same features, and we've made some of the same choices as Java in certain cases. In the early days, I made many of the same choices as C and Perl because that's what I knew and that's what people around me knew. So we try to cater to what people expect. How do they expect something to work? Well, they expect it to work like this because that's where they have experience. As PHP grew and as Java got more popular, and other languages as well, people came out of universities not knowing C at all, which is very disappointing to me, but they came out of universities knowing a hell of a lot of Java and they expected PHP to behave a certain way because Java behaved that way. And it's like, so some of these concepts that came out of Java, yes, they came into PHP for that reason. But really, I mean, I just feel like some of these concepts, you, you, people credit them to Java as if Java invented objects or something. It's like, obviously it didn't, right? Um, they came from more sort of academic computer science principles that tend to be the same across languages. Cool. Uh, first, I feel a little silly saying this, but a profound thank you for everything. Really. <laughs> You're welcome. Really. Um, I guess two questions, two part question. One is um, like what motivates you like as a human mm. being, as a maybe <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it there. Okay. And um, I guess somewhat related potentially is how do you process like people who are highly critical of PHP? Ah. Those are kind of the same thing actually. <laughs> um, not really, not, not in the way you think. I went to, I think in, I don't even remember the year anymore, 2005, 2006. Um, I went to Sri Lanka and did a talk at a university there, which was really cool. Um, but I met a couple of kids and there had just been a tsunami that had killed a bunch of people in Sri Lanka. 
and they were devastated because one, one person's grandmother had died in the tsunami and they were just, they wanted to know how can we help, what can we do? And they were talking about this sorry state of disaster recovery management and how aid that flew into Sri Lanka was completely mishandled and left in hangars to rot and nobody knew anything and Sri Lanka itself didn't have infrastructure. So they wanted to fix that. And they started, they asked me about it and they said, what can we do? How can we, we want to write something. Can we write some code? Can we do something? We sat down and we sort of planned out what possibly could be done. I mean, I didn't help much. I just sort of encouraged them a little bit. Um, and they came up with this system called Sahana. And it's kind of a disaster management system in a box that has a people recovery function, for example, where you have a mobile app now. You didn't have to, that back then, but you now have a mobile app and the back end PHP code where basically when a rescue worker finds somebody, figures out what's your name and takes them to some shelter and they type it into the thing and say, hey, this particular person is in that shelter over there. Great. Register the central database. There's a web interface. People who are looking for their grandmother can go, hey, she's over there. It's completely simple kind of things, but it just isn't there in most countries that get hit by this stuff. Um, also, aid coming in, it's like this, we now have diapers in warehouse 12. Okay, ding, ding, ding on the, on the app. It's now in the central database. People can look it up who need diapers. They know where they are, right? Simple stuff like that. Sahana has now been used in over 50 disasters around the world. It was used in Haiti. It's been used in Christchurch in New Zealand. It was used in Sri Lanka again a few times. It has literally saved people's lives. That's what motivates me. And when people criticize and write on their WordPress blog how much they hate <laughs> PHP, <clears throat> come on, right? <laughs> I, I really don't care what they have to say. Right? PHP has literally saved somebody's life. Even if it may only be one, I have no idea, right? But I, I'm pretty sure it has probably saved somebody's life over the years. That's all I need. And it might save another life one day. Thank you. Out of time? You're the boss on this. Uh, we have time for one more, if anyone else yeah? okay. in the room has any questions. I don't think I can top that last one. Though, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, folks.